You're watching Go Live On Demand with Pastor Smokey Norfolk and Victory Cathedral Worship Center. Your hope, healing, and empowerment starts now. Stand, let's get right to the heart of the matter and turn to 127th number of Psalm, verse 1. The 127th number of Psalm, familiar passage, you know it. And then we're going to jump over to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 4 through 7. I'm dealing with love today. 127th number of Psalm, verse 1, and then 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. The revelation God, that God has given me in this word is so incredible. It blessed me. I preached to myself, and I shouted myself. So I hope and pray that it is a blessing to you that God gives new revelation to his divine word. Amen? It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the, the builders labor in vain. Unless who builds it? Unless who builds it? Unless the Lord builds the house. Tell your neighbor, you got to say something, the Lord. No, no, check them, check them right quick, check them. Check them hard. The Lord, you better say something. You're going to sit here silent in the sanctuary next to me today. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guard stands watch in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house. In other words, unless you have the foundation built upon the word of God unless you have the word of God building your house, your marriage your relationship, any situation any circumstance, it's going to fail let me set you up for what your expectations should be unless God builds it it will not last are you with me? you want a, you want a strong marriage? you want a strong single life? you want a strong relationship? you want a strong anything? you've got to have God as the foundation You've got to have God as the foundation. Unless the Lord builds the house, it cannot stand. They who labor, labor in what? In other words, you're wasting your time. All the dating sites. Oh, help me, Jesus. What is it? Blacksingles.com? Blackpeoplemeet.com? What's the church ones? There's some, there's some Christian ones, too. Christianmingle.com. All the mingling in the world don't change the foundation being in God. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. 1 Corinthians 13. Come on, let's turn over here and talk about love for a minute. Love. So many people use your name in vain. Ooh, some of y'all, come on back to church. Come on back. Come on back. Somebody say, ah. Bring it on back to Jesus. Yes, Jesus loves me. Man, I see where y'all been. God, that's my child. Music soul child. First Corinthians 13, when you got to say amen. amen. Let's talk about love for a moment. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. You remember when? Remember that time when? Look at your neighbor saying, I thought you loved me. Let it go. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in, with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. And always perseveres. God, give me grace to preach and to teach your word on today. I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being in this sacred place. Let our time together not be wasted, but let it be fruitful. The word of the Lord that is going forth, let it impregnate our spirits with possibility and potential and let us leave it better than we came in Jesus name. Thank you for what you're about to do. You set it up and we thank you for giving us a greater understanding. Let the redeemed of the Lord with a great expectation and anticipation of what God is about to do. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You're not expecting much. Shout it like you mean it. Hallelujah. Now say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of our awesome God. So, I have a few pictures for you, and hopefully these pictures will help us. I've been trying to find pictures of what love looks like. 
I'm trying to see even if I see it in the congregation today. We in trouble. <laughs> so check these pictures out. Is this what love looks like? Bone Quisha? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Where's Brother Johnny today? I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you here. She looked like she about to eat that finger. <laughs> Is that what love looks like? What's the next one? Is this what love looks like? How many of you have been to dinner, to lunch, and this is what the picture looks like? Or how many of you have seen it? Because you don't want to admit it because they're sitting next to you today. So, Is that what love looks like? Or is this what love looks like? Yeah, that's so sweet. Is that water? Amen. Or is this what love looks like? That's so special. They reading a book together. They must be newlyweds. <laughs> I want to give us a greater understanding of what love is. I want to talk about it from a context that is only the, the only place, the only foundation for truth, and that is the word of God. Unless the Lord builds the house and how he builds it is through the confidence of his word, through the testimony of his truth through the dissemination of information that will change and translate into wisdom and give you proper application of all that you hear and all that you gain. It is imperative that you start with God. If it's going to work, it has to begin with him. And if it's going to begin with him, it has to begin with his word. Amen? amen. Haven't lost anybody, have I? If I haven't, say amen. amen. My prayer is that by the time you get to the conclusion of this sermon, you will be able to sing this new hymn it says, I can see clearly now, the rain is gone. Y'all know this? Sing it with me. I can see all obstacles in my way. Come on, sing it like you know it. Gone are the dark, they're gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. I know you know this part. It's going to be a, oh. Slap your neighbor and say, stay on your note and sing. It's going to be a bright, oh, bright sunshine. Yeah. I can't wait. The reality is, many of you can't see a bright, sunshiny day because you've been informed by several different capacities or several different facets of life, but they don't equate to being the truth. The only way that we're going to get to the truth of what is true is that we go back to the foundation of truth, which is the word of God. Except the Lord builds the house, all of your laboring is in vain. Three places that inform us in our lives. First of all, the home you grew up in. Many of us are shaped by the experiences of our childhood, by what we witnessed, the relationships between our mother and our father, the relationships between them and outsiders. We now are informed and we become what we behold. That's why you've got to be careful what your kids behold. Oh, that was good preaching whether you say amen or not. Because they become what they behold. It has been what you have beheld that has caused you now to be who you are. We're also informed by our friends and our associates. Some of us, we have people that are continually and perpetually in our ear telling us what's right, what's not. What we should do. Girl, you should do this. You should do that. Man, I'm telling you, brother, if you try this right here, it's going to work. We are shaped by the conclusions that are drawn by the people that are in proximity to us, that are around us. And then lastly, the greatest influencer for how we are formed, our formation process, especially in this day and time. As a matter of fact, more in this day and time than any other time in the history of mankind, media shapes how we think, how we feel, and how we form as individuals. So our understanding of love is really shifted shaped and contorted and sometimes twisted by what we see in the media as a matter of fact what you put in is what you'll get out do you have it what you put in is what you'll get out so many of you have majored in monitoring dysfunction every housewife show capitalizes off of dysfunction 
And because of our voyeuristic nature, our desire to be nosy. I ain't nosy, I'm just curious. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but at the end of the day, you keep watching every week. Why? Because you're nosy. And you want to know what's going on in their lives. Well, unfortunately, what they're exemplifying is dysfunction. As a matter of fact, we have a former member. She's probably watching right now, and I love her to death. I'm not going to call her name, but I love her so much. They put her off of one of those shows because she didn't have enough dysfunction. They wanted more drama, more, come on, give us more. We need more. Pick a fight. Beat somebody up on a boat. <laughs> Y'all will get that later. But we want to make sure that we have the, 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 the dysfunction because people are drawn to this. Unfortunately, it's the reality of our lives. And it has formed us. It has shaped us. Whether you know it or not, subtly, in very subtle ways, the messages have been distributed to us. Everybody's rooting for Olivia Pope. But Olivia Pope is breaking up a happy home. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's offering time. My God. So there are certain reasons that we get married and it's because of our, and in our formation, we now have misguided understandings of why we should get married because we've seen all of these other dynamics. But again, I'm taking us back to the word of God, which is the truth of God. And it is the reason and the way and the, and the means by which we can see success and fruitfulness and longevity in our relationships. But let's be honest about it because of all of the other areas of information some of us get married for various reasons. Some of us get married because we're lonely. Loneliness and isolation causes you to say, I just need somebody in my life. And then you end, and you end up getting anybody. Oh, my God. If you're already there, it's too late. Look right ahead. Do not look to the left. Do not look to the right. Knew I shouldn't have married you. <laughs> some of you get married for sex. Because you think that it's going to be the solution for you now having a righteous, intimate relationship. It's like, I'm tired of living in sin. Let's just go on and get married. No, let's just stop sinning. <laughs> when we living together, we, you know, we shacking. My mama, you know, I'm shacking up. Let's just go on and get married. And then you marry someone who is not a suitable mate. Because you married them for the wrong reason. Some of you marry for escape. Some people marry for escape. They want to get out of their current circumstance. Some people just want to leave their mom and daddy house. Tired of being here. I'm ready to go. You, 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 me, let's do it. It's my way out. Trying to escape whatever my circumstance, whatever my situation is. Some people marry for the fantasy. You want the picture. That's what I call it. You want the picture. You want the appearance of the happy life. You want the two, you want the, the, the husband and the wife, the two children, the picket fence, the, and the dog. You want the wedding, but you don't want the sacrifice. You love the experience of the wedding, but you don't even love the person. Am I preaching yet? Oh, glory to God in the highest. But what you got to understand is that there will come a day that will be after the wedding day. And then you got what you got. They had a beautiful wedding. The honeymoon only lasted one week. Now you got to wake up and look at them. Every day for the rest of your life. Mm. What was I thinking? <laughs> Some people marry because of their age. They want to make sure that their biological clock is ticking. I got to hurry up and find somebody. And then they choose anybody. Not even checking the history of this man's DNA. Brothers, you better find out if she crazy, if her mama crazy, if her grandmama was crazy. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Forgive me, I'm sorry. And the Lord says, some people marry for peer pressure. Because they got so many people in their ear. Everybody else is getting married. I'm the last one. 
Everybody in my, all my friends married. They got spouses and I'm the last one. And so because of peer pressure, they just look out and they find somebody. And then somebody, some people rather marry for this last reason, which probably, it has a legitimate side, but it also has an illegitimate side. The illegitimacy of it only comes because of your misunderstanding of it, because of your lack of knowledge and insight. It is a legitimate reason when you really understand what it is. And what's that, Pastor? It's love. Most people marry from a heart love, but not a head love. There is a distinction between the two. There is a heart love which majors in feelings and emotions. Then there is a head love that is centered around your decisions. Head love is what sustains a relationship when heart love is not there. Are you with me? Please pay attention because this is going to be really good and helpful for somebody. It takes about 18 to 24 months for love to travel from the heart to the head. Y'all got it? Let me say it another way. Let me break it down. It takes about 18 to 24 months before the heart love or those that are predicated upon your emotions become a cognitive decision to love that individual. Okay, y'all still don't have it. It takes about 18 to 24 months for the warm and fuzzy to fall off. For reality to set in that this person is who they are. Are y'all with me? Yeah, because see, understand that you know, relationships go through three stages. First of all, there's the enchanted stage. When you first get together. And you, you want to talk all day. You wake up in the morning and the first thing on your mind is, what you doing? I'm getting dressed. What you doing? I'm getting dressed. What's that noise? I'm brushing my teeth. Because everything is so cute and oh, it's so special. I just love him. She's so sexy. Mm. And you want to spend every waking minute together. And then about 24 months later, you saying, I need some space. Where you going? I'm going to hang out with the boys. I want to go. No. No. But when you first started, it's like, man, I'm coming to pick you up. You know, I mean, this is my girl. You know, man, man, you know, hang out with me. You know, I want to I see you all day, every day. I want to go to sleep. We on the phone at night trying to figure out who's going to hang up first. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. I don't want to hang up. Let's just breathe. <laughs> Everything is cute. Everything is special. Like, oh, his feet stink. Oh, that's so cute. 24 months later, you like, if you don't put some soap and water, why your socks look like that? Got little cockabugs on them. <laughs> Pray for me. I'm doing the best I can. Enchanted stage. Everything is cute. Everything is warm and fuzzy. Everything feels good. Everything is emotionally just, just tantalizing. You just can't get enough of each other. But then you move into the disenchanted stage. That's when the new wears off. That's when reality starts setting in. That's when you start having disagreements. That's when contention comes into play. That's when you toil with one another. And then lastly, you get back out of that cycle and you go back into the re-enchantment phase, which now you come back together, you survive the little turmoil, you go through the little skirmishes, you get beyond your contention, you, did, you find a way to get through your disagreements and you get stronger and make things work. Unfortunately and normally, relationships end or split most of the time in phase two. I don't feel it anymore, so it must not be real to me anymore. In other words, what you're hap what's happening is your heart love is now traveling to a head love. And what you don't, if you don't understand that, you'll start saying, I don't have the same feeling anymore. Something is missing in the relationship. I don't really know if we're falling apart or if I just really don't, if love is not here. But it's not that it's gone. It has moved from your heart to your head. 
And what, what that means essentially is you have to now choose, decide to walk through the contention, get beyond the disagreements, get over the turmoil, and still hold on and cling in love with one another. It's no longer the warm and fuzzy feeling. Now it's a decision that has to be made. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's just relocated from the heart to the head. And when you haven't seen that, you make a decision to throw in the towel, to give it up, to split. And sometimes, you know, it can even be one party is one place and the other is somewhere else. That's why you can't, you cannot relegate yourself to simply a heart love. Because eventually you will move through the disenchantment phase. And when you do, you have to have a decision to love one another in spite of all of the things that you have to go through. Are y'all with me? You've got to decide that I want to love in the proper way, which is holistically both heart and head. But throughout the course of your entire relationship, you will go through cycles. It is not going to always be enchanted. Can my married people say amen? Every day is not sunshine and we don't always like each other. But we have to decide that we will always love each other. That in spite of what comes against us, we will love the hell out of one another. That's why we have to have a proper understanding of what love is. Because if you don't understand what love is, you'll never be successful at loving so let's look at the truth. We want to know what it is. You got to go back to the foundation, except the Lord build the house, except his word be the truth of our foundation. And we, nothing that we do will work. It is all in vain. So what do you say, God? What say ye about this thing called love? Here's what he says in verse four, chapter 13 in first Corinthians. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. So what I need you to get out of that is pay attention to the content of the text. It's patient. It's kind. It's not easily angered. It's not self-seeking. Here's what I need you to understand. This is going to blow your revelation. This is going to blow your mind. This revelation is going to blow your mind right out of the water. So I need you to brace yourself. Hold on. Because this is going to change your whole theology. Love is not a feeling. It's a choice. Many of us, we try to find love and we try to, we get married because of our heart love. We get married because of the feeling. But then when the feeling is gone, through our disenchantment phase, we want to throw the whole thing away. But love is not a feeling. If you look at the text, not one of these things that is listed as a definition or a definitive part of what love is, is a feeling. They are all actionable items that require you not to even think of yourself, but to think of what you will do for somebody else. Love is patient. That's me doing for somebody else. Love is kind for somebody else. I don't envy of somebody else. I don't boast. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. I don't keep any record of the wrong that others do to me. It is not about me. It is about somebody else. And it's not about this warm and fuzzy feeling that we feel is the reason, the premise, the foundation, the basis of our relationship. It's about a decision that you make to honor the other people through these things that are given as a definition of love from God's word, which we know to be the only truth. The reason we got this way, let me tell you why, is because we use, we, we use the word love so loosely now. I, I mean, we'll say things like, I love this chicken. I love this car. I love this watch. I love this hair. Pause. First Corinthians is not talking about what love does for you. What you're saying when you say those things is I love what this does for me. I love how this makes me feel. 
But the true definition of love is not talking about what it does for you. It's talking about what you do for love. So when something does not do anything for us, when it doesn't excite us, when it doesn't look good, feel good, taste good for us, we think we don't have love anymore. But real love is what happens through you, not to you. Y'all have that? Real love is what happens through you, not what happens to you. And a lot of times because we are confused about our understanding of love, we're looking for what can happen to us. We're looking what we can get out of it, what is for us, or how does it make me feel? And if you're not careful, you will marry your best sex and not your best friend. Can I preach it like I feel it today? You will marry this person because they're giving you this great feeling. But can I help y'all out? Lust sex and married sex is two different things. Y'all can y'all y'all gonna be super super deep and saved on me today. I see. Th those are two entirely different things. When you're in lust. You want things all the time. When you're in lust, you do things that do not happen when you get married. I'm just going to let y'all fill in your own blanks. I ain't in your bedroom. I don't know what's happening. Can we be real married folk? Ain't no chandeliers. Ain't no all night prayer meetings. All night. Come on, saints. No, 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 my back bad. I, mm -mm. You're doing too much. In lust sex, boy, you want to hold it all night long. You just want to be there in the moment forever. In marriage, it's like ding, 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 ding. Everybody to your corner. Everybody to your own corner of the ring. Am I telling the truth? Help me, Holy Ghost. That's why you can't go for the feeling. I don't want to just get married for the feeling because the feeling don't last. Always. There will come a day when all you will have is patent and feeling. That's all I can do. Ain't got nothing else left. Pray for me, don't talk about me, doing the best I can. When you marry your best friend, it's not predicated upon feelings. It's not predicated upon what your sex renders. You got a deeper bond. You have a friendship. You have a relationship that if things change, because let's be real, life happens. And things are going to change. You 10 years from now will not be married to the same person that you married 10 years before. Can we be real? Come on, size four. Let's talk about it. I was a 30 in the waist. Well, you ate somebody else. You ain't no 30 now. I'm trying, y'all. I promise I'm trying. I couldn't do it like this at 7.30 service, so y'all getting a little bit more. My mama was here at 7.30. When you marry for what the other person can do for you and how they make you feel, what happens is when life or situations change and they can't give you the same feeling or you can't get the same thing out of it, then you want to discard it, break it off, throw it away but it's because you married with a misunderstanding of what real love is love is not about what you can get but it's about what you decide to give and the key is to make sure that the other person has made the same decision that you have made if they decide to adopt embrace and and realize the same truth of god's word that you have that it's about what I can give you 
that it's about a cognitive decision. It's not about an emotion and a feeling because life changes and feelings change. But what can never change is our decision to love each other through sickness, through health, till death. Do us part. Are y'all with me? Slap somebody until your taste leaves their mouth and say, he is preaching to you today. He is preaching to you today. If you're at home, just slap yourself. Preaching today, boy. You are preaching. So, Pastor, help us out. We want to know what the foundation of love is. We want to know what the foundation of marriage is. We want a sound relationship. For those singles, this is going to help you prepare yourself. For those of you who are married, this is going to help you correct yourself. But either way, it's the word of the Lord. It's the foundation. If you, want, if you want to build a strong relationship, a strong house, then it starts right here. Three things that I'm going to give you, three major things that I'm going to give you, and I'm going to give you some ancillary things there under, so just be pre prepared to write and get ready to flip through the word of God. We're going to hang out in Genesis for quite some time, so you might want to go on and go there. Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 through 28. The first thing that you need to understand or the first foundation of marriage is to know that marriage was created with a plan. God had a plan for marriage. He had a sustaining, sanctified, divine plan for marriage. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, it says, And God said, let, that, let us make man in our image. Whose image? God's image. Let us, meaning Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, the Word was God. We know that in John, he says that the Word made flesh was Jesus Christ. So then when he says, let us, he's saying, let us, as in the Godhead. And God said, let us make man in our image, in the image of God. After our likeness, let him have dominion, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said to them, what? Come on, read it out loud. And, and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. God's plan for marriage was to reproduce himself in the earth. So what you have to do is get over yourself and understand that marriage was not just created to benefit you. But marriage was created to benefit God. It was created to bring glory to God by recreating or reproducing himself in the earth. His instruction that he gave was, you will recreate people that look like me because you were made in my image and you will raise a godly seed. That was the whole reason behind it. Create, the marriage was created with a plan. It was two dynamics of that plan, procreation and recreation. Procreation, I need you to recreate yourself because you were made in my image, which will recreate me in the earth and cause godly seed to populate the earth. So I'm doing this to bring glory to myself. But in the process, I'm also recognizing that it's not good for you to be alone. So I'm going to give you a suitable help me to be with you. Someone that I can create that's going to be your companion in this process. So procreation and recreation. Let me say it a different way. The monkey's got somebody to play with. The giraffe's got somebody that they can hang out with. Everybody's got somebody that they can be with except for you. Because I just created man and I didn't create woman yet. So he then reached into man and he creates woman. And now there is a suitable helpmeet, a union that can come together. So that is someone that you can commune with, fellowship, relate to, someone that talks like you, looks like you, someone that thinks like you, somebody that laughs at your, your bad jokes. Somebody that puts up with the things that you put up with and likes the things that you like and doesn't like the things that you don't like. He gave you procreation and recreation. There was a plan for God for marriage rather in God. Second thing that you need to understand about the foundations of marriage is that you are connected by divine power. 
when you are united with a man, when you are united with a woman, let me say it a different way. When a man is united with a woman and a woman is united with a man, you are connected with divine power. It's crazy. We have to say that in this day and age. In Genesis, the second chapter, verses 15 through 17, and the Lord God took man and put him into the garden. He put him where? Who put him there? Come on, talk to me. He put him where? In the garden of Eden. And, he, and who put him there? God. So does God know where he is? Why? Because he, because he put him there. He put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, every tree of the garden that might eat is freely, except the one of the good knowledge of good and evil, because when you eat it, you will surely die. Who put him there? And he put him where? And he knows where he is? How does he know? Intersections are perfectly planned by God. When God gave, got ready to bring a woman to the man, God didn't have to look for Adam because he knew where he placed him. Just the same thing is relevant to you today. God knows exactly where you are and he knows where the mate is that he's going to present to you. So you don't have to go out hunting for them. Not about a little fat baby with an arrow striking somebody in the heart. It's about God divinely orchestrating and setting everything up. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. It will be because of God's divine leading that your right person, that suitable mate, will be right in the right place at the right time, introducing you to the right people. Can, are y'all with me? So you don't have to force it. Some of y'all showed up because you heard that the mate was in church. I met Carla Norfolk, who was Carla Morris in J.C. Penney. She wasn't even in the church like that. She was listening too short. Don't y'all tell I told you. You better not say nothing. Tupac. She was a ghetto prophetess. Please don't, please don't tell her. She will cut me. God set it up. God knows where your mate is. The same way he knows how to bring you money for your light bill. He definitely knows how to bring you the person that's going to spend the rest of your life with you. Look at Genesis, the second chapter, verses 18 through 22. It is divine power that's going to bring you together. Divine power is what unites you. Amen? It's not just your luck, chance, happenstance. It's not the dating sites. It's God's power. It's not because you go to the right club and this club got the finest women. Everything fine. All right, I'm going to leave it right there. Genesis 2, 18 through 22. Watch this. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone, so I will make him a helper suitable for him. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. I will make him a helper suitable. Say suitable. Say it one more time. That means it's a good fit, a compliment, suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man and said, what would you call them? And whatever he called the living creature is what its name was. Verse 20, the man get, gave, gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the sky, every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper. There was no one, nothing that was suitable for him. So the Lord God caused him to go into a deep sleep, fall upon the man, a deep sleep rather, to fall upon the man. He slept and then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman, the, a woman, the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. See, sometimes people understand the key word here, the optimum word is suitable. Sometimes people want someone or they desire a mate but that mate does not compliment them. Can I help you out, brothers? They may look good on your arm, but they may not be suitable for you. Being eye candy does not necessarily mean that they're going to suit your purpose in life. In order for God to send you a helpmate, it has to be someone who is suitable for you. 
Everything that looks good ain't good for you. You ever seen somebody, when you see their mate, you say, my God, how did they get down? <laughs> this your wife? If you say so. But then they open their mouths, and you're like, oh, yeah, I get it. Because they don't have sense God gave a bullfrog. But they look so good. And you realize once they open the mouth, they say, mm, thank God you got a nose. Because if you didn't have a nose, you wouldn't have nothing between your ears. Now, don't you say that to anybody. Suitable, say that word. In order for God to send you a suitable helper, it insinuates that you have to be doing something that you need help with. It's not going to happen just because God says, I'm going to send you a suitable helper. No, I'm going to send you someone that's suitable to help you do what you are called and assigned to do. And if you're not doing anything, then you're not qualified for a helper. Are y'all with me? Genesis 2, 15 through 17. Let's look at it again. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. To do what? Say it again. Dress it and to keep it. He put him there to do what? Let me give you another word. Say work. work. He gave him work. But then he gave him a commandment in verse 16. He commanded the man saying, eat of every tree. In other words, he gave him a word. So the man had work and word. Before God brought the woman to him. Not after. If you're not working on a dream, something bigger than you, something that God has obligated you to do, then God is no, he's not obligated to send you someone to help you. So you can't wait for them to get work and word later. That was the prerequisite for God bringing the woman to the man. There's too many women. Can I just be real with y'all today? They'll see work but they don't see word. And if they don't have both, then they're not suitable. <laughs> I'm going to help y'all whether you want it or not. Let's back up for a minute. I don't want you to miss this revelation. Look at verse 20, Genesis 2 and 20. But for Adam, this was not found a suitable helper. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Watch this. He took one of his ribs and then he did what closed up the flesh at that place he took a rib and closed up the flesh in that place he took a rib then closed up the flesh in that place and watch this then he fashioned woman into with that from that rib so he created man but he fashioned woman let me do it again he created man, but he fashioned. Brothers, y'all ought to be a saved man right there. <laughs> Glory to God in the highest. Thanks be to God. Thank you for fashioning. Thank you, Lord. He fashioned woman, and then he brought her to the man. Y'all have it? Here it is. He brought her to the man... But it was a prerequisite before he brought the woman to the man. If you look at what happened, he put him into a deep sleep, took out a rib. But the key here is that he did what? Closed the wound. Too many sisters are finding wounded men, but the wound is not closed. Until the wound was closed, God said, you're not ready yet for me to bring the woman to you. So he had to first close the wound. Let me help you understand. You are not capable of closing the wound. Instead of trying to find a project and becoming a divine spiritual and emotional surgeon... 
How about you give them Jesus? Let him fix them first and then say, now you're ready for him to bring you to them. <laughs> this ain't popular preaching. Watch this. Preach, boy, anyhow. Thank you, Jesus. When I talk about sex, everybody was hollering amen. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. When you have work, when you have the word, when you have wholeness, when you have been restored by God, now you're qualified for a suitable helper. God is not obligated to give you help and you're not even working. And I'm not talking about a job. You can have a job and still not be living in purpose. I mean, you're working on something that is divinely assigned. The passion and the purpose for your existence is tied around what God has created you to do. And that's what your work is. All the rest of it is on the way to that, des that desired destination. Everything else is a stepping stone for you to get to your purpose. But until you are in your purpose, you truly have not experienced the work that God has for you. Are you with me? Yeah. Lastly, and this is the biggest category of all. If you're going to understand the foundation of relationship or the foundation of marriage, understand that you come together by godly precepts. God brings you together by godly precepts. In other words, there are rules, there are laws, there are principles that have to be put into place. And God has given you those principles. Look at Genesis 2 and 23. Genesis, the second chapter, verses 2. I'm sorry, Genesis, the second chapter, verse 23, 24, and 25. Genesis 2, 23, 24, and 25. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother, his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. If you are having any trouble in your marriage, where are my married folks? Let me see your hands. All right, I'm preaching to you now. If you are having any troubles in your marriage, it can be traced to one of these four things. And it's found in the godly precepts of this text. First of all, verse 24 says, for this reason, a man shall what? Say it again. Say it one more time. Married folks, say it louder. Leave his father and his mother. First thing that you need to check is cutting. Cutting. C-U-T-T-I-N-G. Cutting. That's the first thing that needs to be checked if you are having any trouble in your relationship. Cutting. For this reason, a man shall leave. Another word to say it is cut his father and his mother off. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't honor them, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Doesn't mean that you don't love them. But what it does mean is that you cut them off as the priority of your life. Mm. It's real quiet at 10 o'clock. I'm going to have to work this thing right here. If, you, if you're having trouble, you need to figure out what is remaining in your life that's more important than your spouse. And that needs to be cut from your life for this reason. Now, it names a very vital relationship. The reason that it says your father and your mother is not that it's exclusive to father and mother. But it's preaching, it is giving you and instructing you that this is the most vital and valuable relationship that is known in the lives of mankind. Our relationship with our mother and our father are the most important relationships that we have. So it's saying that if I'm instructing you to cut your mother and your father as the principal priority in your life, then every other relationship should not come close to being a hindrance in making your spouse your priority. Are y'all with me? Sometimes people are having problems because there are some things that need to be cut from their lives. Sometimes people have marital problems because mama and daddy are too much in your business. Their friends need to be cut. Your associates, some of them need to be cut. The wife is having to compete with parents and friends. The husband is having to compete with what your mama said because your mama ain't married. 
I'm going to leave that alone. I went too far, did I? I went too far. Your mama ain't been married. She's been married six times. And your dad ain't never been down the altar. They can't tell you how to be successful in this house. Let's go to the word of God. And let's cut. Can I help some of you all understand, especially those who are in blended families? Nothing is to take priority over your spouse. That's the word of God. This is going to hurt your feelings. I need you to listen to me good. I ain't talking about what I'm saying. I'm saying what he's saying. Even your children. I know that's a tough pill to swallow because we love our kids. We love our children. But that's why you got to be more guarded and cautious. That's why you got to have a greater understanding of love before you jump into a marriage. Because the covenant that you're making is that you're going to cut, leave, cut some things and some people out of your life. So you got to ask your question, is there anything that might be posing a threat to your spouse? That doesn't just mean family members, friendships, but also business interests, careers. Is anything taking a priority over this? And if it is, you can guarantee there will be problems manifested in the future. Is there anything in your relationship that needs to be cut? Second thing that you need to understand, if you're having trouble, you need to check this out. The next, next part of the verse says, and be joined to his wife. In other words, it means that there has to be cleaving. It means to, over, to cleave is to overwhelm them with love. It is to reaffirm them, to validate them, to create security for the woman, to create affirmation in the man. To cleave means I'm going to love you so hard, so diligently that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I got your back, that I'm in your corner, that I'm with you, that I'm on your team. And there are ways to exemplify your cleaving, to affirm that I'm with you, that I have your back. When she goes to make up the bed, brothers, get on the other side. Pull up the covers with her. Cook breakfast. Serve one another. One of the greatest lessons I taught my sons, I sat there one day when they were younger and I watched them. And the mother came home from the grocery store. And you know how when you get home, you got a trunk full of stuff. My children sat there, my boys sat there and watched their mother bring in the groceries. I hit the roof. I waited until she was done because I said, as soon, surely something going to kick in. Something going to happen. Oh, divine inspiration. Help them, Holy Ghost, right now before I lay hands upon them. <laughs> Jesus' name. But then it hit me. They don't know. Because nobody has taught them what it is to cleave. They don't understand. So I brought them in. I said, listen, did you see your mama? Did you see her bring all these groceries in? I said, I intentionally sat here because I, didn't want, I wanted to know whether or not you all would help your mother bring in groceries from the car. And of course, it was a great lesson. It was a teachable moment. And I taught them so well. I guess I put the fear of the Lord in them that they won't even let me carry groceries in the house. Dad, you need some help? They come running downstairs. You need us to help bring something in? No, I'm good. I got it. But it gave me great joy to know that I'm teaching them how to treat the woman in their life. That I'm giving them the value of serving, of cleaving to one another, of affirming them and letting them know I got your back. When she's depleted and she needs to know that she has some help, she needs to know that somebody's in a relationship with them in the house. You can be there and just be like roommates if there's no cleaving. You can't just cut away, but you have to cut and cleave. Cut and cleave. Are you with me? Cut and cleave. Cleave is to overload their circuits with love. Let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I love you. Not just in theory, but also in practice. Then next there's confirming and affirming. You got a uniting purpose. The woman responds to the efforts of the man, says that I am affirming or I'm confirming you. And they shall become what? One flesh. Becoming one flesh means that I'm affirming you and confirming 
in every way. And not only that, I'm also conforming to you. I can look at your spouse and tell you how your marriage is going. Because of how they're being affirmed and how they're conforming to the image of your relationship. If you really want to know how somebody's marriage is doing, you have to be nosy. Just look. My wife this week, she came home after dropping the boys off from school. I was up in my office. I was working on this sermon. And about an hour and a half or so later, she came back downstairs. She had sleep lines on her face. Clothes was disheveled. Hair was all over the head. She pulled it all back and had a little ponytail. But what got me is that she said, I'll be back. <laughs> Where you going? <laughs> you people going to think I'm Harpo and I done beat you. What's, what's going on? What's up? What's, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? Because you're a reflection of this relationship. And they're going to swear I am beat. I knew. I knew Pastor was beating First Lady. I knew he was beating up. But she said, I'm going to the beauty shop. Carry on. Don't make no stops. Go straight to the shop. A lot of times men get frustrated because they go out of their way to please, to make happy their wives, their spouses. But understand this, men don't know, they don't know well how to cut and cleave. They struggle in that area, cut and cleave. But women don't know how to respond when they do. A friend of mine told me a story about him when he worked very diligent, very hard to buy a house. He says, I like, his wife coming, she said, I like this house. I like it. This is nice. He worked years to build up money. And resources to be able to buy her this, what he considered the dream house. She said, I like this house, but in my next house, not a thank you. See, it makes the man say, I tell you what, I ain't doing nothing else. They feel unappreciated. Please understand me, and I got to say this because I'm black. If you're married to a black man, you must affirm him. You absolutely must affirm him. Most black men are in a desert when it comes to celebration. 90% of the places that we go, we are tolerated, not celebrated. Everywhere I go, I'm a suspect. And don't let me have on sunglasses and a hoodie. So if the world sees a suspect, then when I come home, what I really don't need to be is beat down in the streets and then beat up at the house. Come on, I, I wish I had some brothers that would say amen right through here. Let me help you understand this. Delilah was not attractive. Everybody knows the story of Samson and Delilah. Delilah was not an attractive person. And she didn't sleep with Samson. Samson had slept with a prostitute right before he went with Delilah. She didn't sleep with Samson. But she got more out of Samson than anybody else was ever able to get out of him. Why? Because she knew how to stroke his head and speak to the king that was locked up inside of him. There are two things that are inside of every man. There's a king and a fool. I'm going to let you think back. Just, just, just have a little flashback. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's a fool in there. But watch this. Whichever one you speak to responds. If you speak to the king, the king will respond. If you speak to the fool, that's why you've been getting what you've been getting. Come on, the last one. I'm done. My time is up. Communing. Communing. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. They had total, complete fellowship, transparent communication and communion with one another. And when you can't communicate, when there is no connectivity, when there is no transparent, complete 
and absolute nakedness with one another. It's because one of the other three things is deficient. You got to go back and check cutting, cleaving, and confirming. If one of those other three things is out of sync, then it's going to affect your ability to commune with each other. The communion of your relationship will organically come together once you have these other three things in place. When interviewed, about 85% of men that cheated said that they needed something. I'm sorry, not even men, people. Let me look at my notes correctly. People said that it was because they were missing something emotionally. Not a physical longing, not even a lust for longing. But it was an emotional deficiency because one of the three things was missing. Cutting, cleaving, or confirming. Whenever I sit down and I want to do marital coaching with people, I'm always looking through the filter of trying to figure out which one of these areas is missing. Is it cutting, cleaving, or is it confirming? And it doesn't take me long to figure out whether there's affirmation or whether there's deterioration taking place. Whether they're confirming or whether they're trying to crucify one another. Whether they need to let some things go, cut some things off. Or whether they're coming together and unifying against the world. My prayer today is that something that I've said, something in the word of God has moved you to a position that you desire to be pleasing first to him by honoring the godly precepts of his word, understanding the true principles of love for looking for him before you look for them. Know that he will bring them into the right place. My prayer is that God has moved in this place today so that your relationships will be stronger, your marriages will be such that the enemy cannot prevail against them. If I have helped you with his word today, then don't think about me. But I need you to tell God thank you right here with a shout of praise. Oh, bless him, not me. Come on, thank him. Lift him, honor him. Tell him I appreciate you speaking into my life. I'm better now that I came. I'm better in Jesus' name. Come on, stand all over the building. God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the godly principles and precepts that you have taught me on today. Thank you for unlocking my true understanding so that I know what love really is. Thank you that I won't continue to look for feelings, but I am looking through faith. Believing, God, that the word of the Lord is my only truth. It is my foundation. It's going to give me what I need to be fruitful, to be successful. Thank you, Lord, that my relationships will be stronger as a result of having followed you. For every married couple, lift your hand in the air right now in the name of Jesus. I speak over your marriage. I declare victory over anything that the enemy has thrown against you. God, give grace and discernment that they will understand where cutting needs to take place. Give them the power and the strength beyond themselves to cut things and people that need to be cut out of their lives. Give them now the grace, the capacity to cleave one to another and love each other in a way that is beyond their own natural capacity. Give them a head love and not just a heart love. Let them make a decision today to love in spite of. The truth of the matter is, God, you love us in spite of. None of us have been perfect in your sight. And so give us the ability to love like you love. Agape and unconditional. Every married person, put your hand down. If you're single, slip it in the air right now in the name of Jesus. For every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every person that is single under the sound of my voice, give them the right and righteous way. Let them now operate and function in the truth of your word. And there are some people, God, who've had failed marriages. Give them the ability to understand and know that they're not a forgotten people. That you forgive them so they can forgive themselves. And understand that they move forward with your truth. That every decision that they make hence now and forever will be a decision that is graced by you. Give them spiritual discernment to see what they need to see. To discern and feel what they need to feel. But to do what they need to do. Help them now, oh God, in every area. And for every married person, every single person that receives this prayer for your own sake. I want you to lift your hands, both of them, and give God a shout of praise that reverberates to heaven. 
Come on, thank him in advance for what he's about to do. Glory to your name, Jesus. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. G-Y-A. It means give yourself away. And at Victory, it's more than just a slogan. It's who we are. We're living to be missed, not just remembered. And thanks to your generous support, we're changing the world one heart at a time. Find out more and give now at getthevictory.org slash G-Y-A. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more information about what's happening in and around Victory, visit us online at smokynorfolk.com. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Be blessed and keep walking in victory.